Welcome back to another ram.js video and in this video we are going to talk about the function empty but to give you a sneak peek of what's coming in this video we're also going to talk about monoids we're going to talk about fantasy land uh, monoids or monoids that follow the fantasy land specification so I want to try to do a little bit of a better job than in the last video when we sort of dive into the fantasy land specification now surely there is a series on fantasy land on the fantasy land specification coming but that's way into the future so it was my understanding that in the last video some of you found it a bit uh, tricky to to sort of uh, grasp exactly what was going on when we talked about when we sort of dived into the fantasy land specification I assume that the rest of the video sort of worked fine but but it's um, if you haven't looked at type classes before it can easily be kind of alienating so I'm gonna try to explain a bit better I was considering whether I should redo the last video but but I think I'm gonna just simply try to explain monoids better and then hopefully you can use your your understanding of how to understand monoids to also understand applicative functors so applicative functors what was or was what we talked about in the last video in regards to the fantasy land specification um, but yeah let's let's just dive into it and and let me know in the comments if I'm messing this up and if you think I should sort of approach this differently and and also ask if you have any questions by the way this is a series on Ramda remember to subscribe if you're not already uh, already subscribed let's get into it so what is the function empty well the function empty let's look at the type definition take something of type a something and then return something of the same type another thing of the type a or another thing of type a now the thing is of course that's syntactically right on the type level but semantically what it does is that it returns let's let's read this definition here it returns the empty value of its arguments type right so if you pass it a string it's going to return an empty string right because it's it's returning the empty value representation of that or, or, for the type uh, the, <clears throat> of the thing that you've passed it right so you're passing it a string so the type is string and then you get back an empty string if you pass a list right a list of ABC or like a list of one two three or whatever or an empty list then you get back an empty list right because that's the that's the empty value for that type uh, and then let's let's uh, read on here so okay uh, Ramda defines the empty value of array as empty array oh sorry actually what they mean is I, I thought they meant they define the empty value as but rather it's like Ramda defines empty values for the following types and the following types are array object string and arguments so arguments I assume is the arguments array which is not really an array right where it's like you can collect the arguments that are passed to a function I assume it's something like that let's let's maybe we, we dive if we dive into the uh, source code then maybe we can figure that out but otherwise array <clears throat> fairly straightforward object fairly straightforward and string fairly straightforward right it's just it just returns the empty uh, the empty um, uh, the empty element right for for uh, for that particular type and then here's the interesting part right other types are supported if they define this uh, let's say static uh, method right because it's like a, it's an it's an uh, it's a uh, method called empty that's defined on the type so type dot empty or type dot prototype dot empty which is an instance method called empty or implement the fantasy land mo monoid specification so <clears throat> uh, in some sense yeah, one of these uh, type dot empty or type dot prototype dot empty is in accordance with the Fantasyland monoid specification. I would guess that it's the first one here, type dot empty. But either way, uh, these when 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 uh, when you just say type dot empty or type dot prototype dot empty, then it, you don't necessarily follow the Fantasyland specification, but you have your own implementation of empty. Uh, so so yeah and then they I guess this is in some sense then just a clarification like dispatches to the empty method of the first argument if present so I mean let's just look at these examples right that they have they say and actually let's actually let's jump into let's jump into node as well so let's say uh, const r is equal to require a ramda whoops like that and then let's say r dot empty to make sure we have that we have that right so if we say r dot empty uh, and here they're saying just 42 I mean obviously I don't have the type just so I assume they mean r dot just here is there such a thing as r dot just no 
and I mean, obviously, I don't have the type just because I haven't defined that. Okay, so I, I guess uh, this is assuming that you're using a library that defines the just type such that it's compatible with the fantasy land monoid specification, right? So, I mean, th this sort of duality between just and nothing is uh, the maybe type. So the type class, uh, the type class? Yes, the type class maybe. And, uh, yeah, I assume then that, that's, that, that that is a monoid, right? Let's just, I mean, yeah, we're going to see whether that's, no, but why is that a monoid? Uh, let's just quickly, uh, is uh, maybe a monoid? <clears throat> it just, that just kind of confuses me. What is wrong with the monoids from me? So here is on, from Haskell. Uh, sorry, I'll just, this is a quick sidetrack. We'll get back to track in, in just two seconds, maybe. But this is like, assuming that A is a semi-group, uh, then there's a monoid. So lift us, no, but this is more complex. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry, I shouldn't do this. Uh, doo -doo -doo. No, in the maybe monoid school of Haskell. Yeah, okay, so so it seems like maybe is actually a monoid. That that sort of confuses me, but clearly I don't know enough about um, about type classes yet. Uh, let's just search for maybe monoid. The maybe monoid follows a common pattern found when writing type class instances for containers. The type of the element is also constrained to being an instance of the class. Uh, let me just try to understand this. I mean, nothing, if you append to nothing, uh, then you get back the x, x plus nothing. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And then if you have just x and then just y, then you have just x my pen. Aha, no, no, no. Okay, sorry, and this is why it's the lifting. Ooh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. This is sort of out of my, uh, yeah. I, it's like, I think I understand it, but I, like I hardly understand it, so I should not try to explain it. it yeah, let's drop it. <laughs> you can use just if you have a library that defines just, because probably that's a monoid. Let's stick to the monoids that we can actually understand. I'll give an example of that. Okay, anyways, let, let, let's, let's continue going. Okay, so, uh, if we look at the other examples, those are super straightforward, right? So then you have r.empty of, let's run that as well. So r.empty, and then we're passing a list of one, two, three, actually exactly what we said before. And then you get back an empty list. If you pass, let's say the string one, two, three, then you get back an empty string. If you pass an object where it's like x is equal to foo, then you get back an empty object. And of course it matters n not at all, right? It doesn't matter at all what's what's inside of this object, right? It's like it could be absolutely anything. So you still get back, I mean, if you pass something of type object then you get back an empty object. And if you pass something of type string, regardless of what this string contains, you get back an empty string. And um, yeah, I mean, you might want to use this, for example, if you think about it, if you have a function that accepts things of a bunch of different types, where all of these types are then in some sense monoids, then uh, what you can do is like, like <laughs> let me, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know, I should have thought about a scenario, but it's like maybe you would want to, uh, yeah, okay, let's say something like that, right? It's like, may, maybe you're checking some property of the thing that you've been passed in, or like maybe you're checking the condition, maybe, maybe it's something like this, right? Maybe you're taking two arguments and you're checking the first argument against some condition. And then you return, if the condition is true, then you return the second thing, like, like you're, you've been passed two things. And if the condition is false, then you're returning the empty value for that other thing, right? So let's say it's like uh, you, you're, you're, you're being passed something like, uh, of, I mean, this is a silly example, right? But it's like you're passing, you've been passed in an email uh, and then, yeah, but that kind of doesn't make any sense. But what's the other thing, right? It's like, <laughs> why, why, why did I not think about this example beforehand? Uh, okay, so let's just say you've been passed true or false, right? And if, if you've been passed true, 
so you're passed true and then an email. And if you've, you've been passed true and then that email, then you just pass on that email. But if you've been passed false and then that email, then let's say that that email is actually invalid. So hence you would return the empty string. I mean, this is a very silly example, but like, or it's very contrived, right? But, uh, but clearly we can, it, was, it, it is conceivable that you might want to uh, return the empty value for something without having to type check for what that thing is. You don't want to care about what that thing is because you might have a function that wants to support both arrays and, and uh, strings and maybe objects. I mean, something like that, right? Um, let me know in the comments if you, if you can think of a, of a sensible scenario. I'll try to think about examples next time before I hit record. <laughs> Apologies. Now let's talk about the more interesting part. So the more interesting part is the monoid specification. So uh, let's actually let's jump in. I think let's jump into the code first. So let's jump into the source code here and let's scroll down and let's look at this. Right. So uh, the implementation of empty. You can see also by the way just, just a pause for reflection that this was a very interesting pattern in in terms of uh, using. Uh, if else uh, a bunch of else statements or a bunch of else if statements when in functional programming I think this was fairly well formatted right it's like what they're saying is that if this is true return that and if that's not true then this is the next else if and then you return that and then this is the next else if and then you return that and then this is the next else if and then and so forth and so forth right so I tend to also use this um, question mark colon or ternary syntax when when doing uh, if else branches in functional programming in order to have to avoid to construct blocks so that you can just say as they're doing here right they're just saying return and then they specify what to return but i've, I've never uh, been able to in a sensible manner uh, construct a, like a bunch of if else's so i think this was actually pretty neat pretty neat maybe you already knew that uh, I thought this was obvious but but I, I didn't actually think about this but anyways let, let's continue okay so so what are these different conditions well the different conditions are that first they're checking okay did you implement did you follow the fantasy land um, or have you passed uh, a class or like an object that has statically quotation marks. I mean, it's not static, but I'm saying like quotation marks statically defined, like on the module has, you've passed in a module that has defined the empty method in accordance with the fantasy land specification, then they'll call that. If however, you've passed something that can be, uh, or rather, sorry, I should say that it's either that you've passed a module or you've implemented empty on the instance level, right? Like those, that, both of these, um, yeah, you would catch, uh, yeah, th th this branch would be true for both of those scenarios. The second branch here, then we are saying, well, maybe you've passed the thing that can be constructed. And if you construct it, then you can call uh, empty on on uh, the thing that's been constructed. I guess it's something like that, right? It's like constructor would get back, would give back, hmm, actually, yeah, I don't know. Let's uh, okay. Sorry, I've also opened the fantasy land specification. Let's just quickly jump to the monoid specification here. I'll, I'll I'll explain more in detail later, but I just want to see. Yeah, okay. So m dot constructor. I just wanted to see whether constructor needs to be invoked or not. So given an m, one can access its type representative via the constructor property. Uh, type rep. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Oh, of course, you get the type. Apologies. So so. Uh, if we jump back to the documentation here, what happens is that this says that if you've passed an instance and if the instance has defined uh, the empty method, then call that empty method on the instance. But it also catches if you've passed sort of a module, like an object, and that object has defined the empty method. Both of those sort of work, right? Uh, and here we're saying if you've passed an object and you ask for it, uh, and uh, and yeah, the, the previous one isn't true, then you can ask for its constructor, which means that you ask for its type. And when you have its type, you can then, uh, uh, why am I being so confusing? Yeah, sorry, I mean, actually, they do say type of here. Oh, no, 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 sorry, okay, that's just to check that uh, if that's a function. Yeah, yeah, so, so what I said about the first thing is true. <laughs> first branch, true, okay, okay, okay. Second branch, uh, again, you you, add, you 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 pass a type. So let's say you pass an animal, uh, you, like an, an actual instance of animal. Then you might say that animal dot constructor, which gives you the type animal. So it brings you back to the sort of class level. 
and then they check whether you've on that class level defined the empty method, right? So here it's like in, a, in an object oriented sense, it's like the static method. Uh, and then the next one, these so th these two first branches, these are for the fantasy land compatible ones. So the fantasy land compatible calls to uh, to empty or to uh, yeah, yeah, to empty on the instance level or to empty on the uh, class level. Let's think about it that way, like on the static level. Uh, so that's part of the fantasy land monoid specification. We'll get into that as well. But then these the, the two that follow these two uh, branches, those represent this one, the type dot empty and the type dot prototype dot empty. So uh, calling the empty method defined on uh, the class level or on the instance level. So notice that it's it's like exactly the same thing. It's just that we don't have this uh, strangeness where it's like when you define, as we talked about in the last video, like when you define methods that are compatible with the fantasy land specification, they can't just be called like, for example, empty, they need to be called uh, fantasy dash land slash empty. That's sort of, sort of how you're specifying that it's compatible with the fantasy land specification. Um, so these two are the are the same thing, but without this sort of fantasy land prefix. So it's like if you have if you if you have a structure that has defined the empty method, but it didn't didn't specify that it's sort of uh, fantasy land compatible. It didn't specify it in it didn't specify the method by saying fantasy dash land slash empty. Then that still works, right? They're sort of saying, well, fine, you can you can have something which which implements the empty method but isn't fantasy land uh, specification compatible. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. And 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 still, we're just reading the the documentation, so it's not the end of the world if you think this is confusing. And and then here is sort of the the sort of the the, the default cases or like the. Uh, the basic cases where or the hard coded cases, right, that, that they mention here, Ramda defines the empty value of array, object, string and arguments. So let's see, that was four, right? So array, string, object and arguments, right? Ah, and arguments was, as we said, um, was uh, and yeah, the arguments that are passed to a function. So I'm just I, I, I got quiet because I was thinking, what will this actually be like if we define, let's just try that out. If we define a function that says console log arguments, let's say, and then we can I do this and then we invoke that function. Yeah, so we get I guess like an empty array. And of course, I can't say length on that. No, I can't say length on that. Yeah, so we get like an empty array, but it's not an array. It's sort of this arguments object. So that, that's a topic for a different uh, discussion, right? But if we just Google arguments object uh, JavaScript, I believe it's like it's array like, but it's not truly an, uh, an array. Uh, yeah, so arguments is an array like object assess accessible inside functions that contains the values of the arguments passed to that function, right? So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's really a topic for a different different discussion. I guess just maybe what would be interesting is how can they ensure then that this arguments is empty, right? Because these would be the arguments of this function. Yeah, let's not dig into that, right? I'm just thinking that if we would pass one, two, three here, wouldn't the arguments, yeah, the length would be three. So anyways, that is that is too much details. But uh, but yeah, you can get back Ah, oh, let's actually maybe sorry, we should try that. What if we say, empty, and then we pass what do we need to pass in order to get that is arguments, ha. Huh. So I actually need to pass some arguments. So can, can I can I instantiate arguments? Actually, yikes, let's do this. Let's say, uh, Let's just do this hack that we did now return arguments uh, like this. So I just I, I'm just creating a function and invoking that and returning the arguments from that. You can probably most probably you can you can actually construct arguments some other way. But now we have some arguments, right? Let's like we have an arguments object. And actually, sorry, I mean, I should check like, uh, okay, so arguments JavaScript. Uh, actually, I wrote arguments object. Yeah, but here. Okay, so that's fine. So can you say new arguments? Array prototype. Huh? Can I just say if I just say arguments, do I always have? No, I don't always have arguments because I'm not in a function. Hmm. So maybe I can't construct them myself. Anyways, 
if you know in the if you know if you can then do let me know in the comments that would be interesting if we can define it but anyways uh, we now have some arguments in this variable args. So uh, what were we going to try out? Right, what we were going to try out is that if we pass those arguments to r.empty, right, let's pass those args, then we get back some arguments that are empty. But I guess the issue is if we instead construct some arguments that actually uh, contain, I mean, we, we have some arguments now, right? We have one, two, three. Ah, okay, and this was a bit unfortunate because maybe... Uh, it's a bit confusing, let's say foo and bar, like that, right? So then, like, the zeroth argument is foo, the first argument is bar. So now we have some actual arguments in the in the variable r. So if I now pass that to empty, what will we get? Yeah, we still get empty arguments. So, so yeah, to understand why that works, one would have to dig into to this a bit more and think about what the arguments here are actually referring to. Um, because this go empty... Yeah, okay, let's not think about that. It probably has something to do with the way they've, I mean, since they curry one. Yeah, since they call curry one. Yeah, okay, 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 well, is, I'm dropping it, I'm dropping it. It, it, it probably makes sense. Um, but yeah, you, you get back an empty arguments object, essentially. Okay, <laughs> let's drop this. So um, I guess the next logical step would be to A, understand the fantasy land specification of monoid, and then to actually implement our own monoid. And I think it probably makes sense to start in this end. If I'm not mistaken, an example of a monoid is, uh, I mean, a list, for example, right? But I think let's, let's do something else than list since JavaScript has lists, right? We have arrays, so, so that would be fairly uninteresting to sort of re-implement uh, list. But what we can do instead is we can implement the data type set. So think about a set. So so actually, let's say set under the operation union. So my understanding is that the data type set under the uh, operation union forms a monoid. So so let's look at, an, yeah, you, just to repeat, right, like union, and now we don't mean like labor unions, we mean set, oops, uh, set, so union from set theory, right? We've talked about this in another episode, actually like specifically about union, I believe. So like if you have these two sets, this this circle to the left is A and this circle to the B, is, <laughs> this circle to the right is B. And if you then say the union, then all of the red stuff here is the union. It's everything in A plus everything in B. But the interesting thing about sets is that it doesn't really matter if you have duplicated items if these items are truly the same. So if you have if you add uh, one, if you have a set that contains one, two, three, and if you take the union, ah, it's like that, right? If you have the set of one, two, three, and the set of one, two, three, and then you say the union of those two, then the resulting set would be the set of one, two, three, not the set of one, two, three, one, two, three, because it doesn't matter. It's like, well, if one is in there, one is in there, like one is in the set. So it's like, you know, it's in there. So we don't need to duplicate it. So, um, so yeah, that's essentially a set, uh, or that's essentially the operation union. Now, what what is uh, the uh, the monoid specification or what is a monoid? A list is also a monoid. I think maybe like positive integers over addition forms a monoid, but like I may be completely wrong here. Um, let me start in this end, right? What are what are we defining here in in the fantasy land specification or what are they defining, right? Uh, they specify uh, like a uh, a set of interfaces that you you could follow if you or should follow if you want to follow the fantasy land specification and could follow if you want to use an algebraic data structure and you want to potentially use other libraries that are fantasy land uh, compatible so it's essentially a way of standardizing of saying that whenever you like like let's say let's say as an example like let's say list was in the specification it's totally not right but but let's say it was like let's say one of these algebraic data structure one of these algebraic data structures was a list it's not right but but let's say it was then maybe they would say that when you define a list and then, then uh, so every definition of a list must have a push method 
for example, right? Or every in, uh, definition of a list must have a slice method on the instance level. That's sort of what we're doing here. We're just specifying like what is the interface of, of something that uh, claims to be of this particular type. And, and, more, uh, and further, we also specify laws. So let's think about those two things, right? So, so the first thing, interfaces, we can think about in this way. Think about object-oriented programming. True, it's, it's actually exactly as if they specify the interface. So when they say there is a, an interface called uh, monoid here, right? Then if you construct your own class and you say that it implements the monoid interface, then it truly needs to implement all of the uh, members, all of the, 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 the public uh, methods that the monoid specification demands. Now, of course, in, in object-oriented programming, I think when you specify an interface and you specify that something implements an interface, you can only actually specify on the instance level, like you can specify requirements on the instance level. But here you can actually specify on the class level as well. But that's sort of the general idea, right? It's just that it looks completely different if you search for monoid and look at the Haskell specification, let's say. So like, let's say Haskell monoid, for example. But that's not because it's completely different. It's just that Haskell has a uh, a completely different syntax for one, and it's also and is also in a different paradigm. So it's not it's not exactly the same because it's not like you have an inheritance hierarchy. You're working with type classes a bit differently, and and you have um, uh, parametric polymorphism, but but metaphorically, it's like exactly that makes no sense. I said metaphorically exactly, but metaphorically exactly, it's metaphorically it's exactly the same thing, right? As if they said that there's an interface called monoid, and whenever you define a structure, a, a data structure, a class, you can claim that that thing follows the monoid specification. And if it follows the monoid specification, if it implements the interface monoid, then that's fantastic because then that means suddenly your data structure is interoperable with every other library that works on monoids, right? Because then you can pass it around as a monoid, right? And 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 if that statement doesn't really make any sense, I would highly suggest you you uh, look at. Uh, for example, my design pattern series, because that, that's sort of the whole idea, right? It's like we're saying, instead of, or it's the idea of coupling to abstractions rather than to concretions. It's the idea of saying that it doesn't really matter that you happen to have a string right now, right? In the context that we're working with this string, it only matters that it is a monoid, for example, right? It's like, uh, let's say, it doesn't really matter that you pass me a number right now, the only thing I care about is that this number is too stringable, let's say. It's like something that implements the method to string so that I can print it to screen, let's say. So that, that could be one potential interface, right? Like too stringable or like uh, printable, let's say. Um, but of course, uh, but, but that's a sort of very trivial type and it's not, I mean, it's reusable in some sense, but but um, but yeah, th when when we talk about, for example, uh, Thai, uh, these sort of quotation marks interfaces of the fantasy land specification, which is actually more sensibly thought of as uh, algebraic structures, uh, then these are on a much more uh, general level. And like, this is way beyond me. I mean, I don't even understand all of these, um, but it's very, very well studied the way I understand it, right? It's like th this stuff is theoretically well studied. In, uh, in category theory. So it's not like somebody just made up an interface and it's like, oh, now everyone please use this interface, right? The utility of these interfaces is uh, is known, right? Or it's it's not known in, in that like we can quanti quantify it, but like it's, it's, um, it's plausible that these would be uh, useful interfaces, quotation marks interfaces, actually algebraic structures. Um, uh, because we've seen we've seen cases of these structures in for example math right so so category theory has analyzed different uh algebras for example in math and then found these different categories but now i really need to stop talking because i'm i'm sort of out of my league right now but uh, but yeah my understanding is that uh, the question that these uh, structures exist, let's say, 
is is uh, that's evident right this we know that there are instances of these types right whether they are useful in your particular scenario that's a totally different question right and i, I guess we'll talk a bit more about this in the in the fantasy land series but but yeah i mean uh, there exist instances of these types and um uh, and yeah, and yeah, okay, and, and the rules of them are well studied. So, so okay, so that was the first part, right? That was the interface part. We were saying that, okay, like syntactically, you need to follow some particular, uh, you need to specify some particular interface. But then semantically, right, that's a different question. And this is something you don't have in interfaces in, for example, uh, object-oriented languages. You can't say like, well, this is the expected behavior or when you call this particular uh, function. So like, Either preconditions, postconditions could be, but but that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is is that uh, let me, let me show you an example. If you go to monoid, which we also looked at when we when we looked at uh, applicative functor last time, there are these rules, right? So this rule is called right identity. This rule is called left identity. And what this says is that if you have a monoid, an instance of a monoid, and you concat that with the empty value of the same type, right? So uh, capital M here is the is the type of which this tiny M or the lowercase M is of. So this is an instance and this is the type. So if you concat, uh, if you take an instance and you concat that to the empty value, then that should be the same thing as just having the original M. And so that's the, called the right identity rule. And the left identity rule is that if you do the reverse, if you take the empty value from from the type, you ask for the empty value, and then you concat that into or with uh, this this lowercase instance m, like an instance of of the same type, then that should also be equivalent to m. Like you're you're stating that this is sort of the, these are the test cases for whether a class truly implements the monoid specification, and uh, and of course like these as we talked about last time these uh, different types tend to be sort of hierarchical. So if we look at this diagram here, you can see that. If something is a monoid, then it must also implement the specification for semi-group. Like it can't be a monoid if it breaks the semi-group rules or if it doesn't have the, the interfaces of semi-group. Now group is a, is a further specialization. So just if something is a monoid, it doesn't necessarily have to be a group. But if something is a group, it necessarily has to be a monoid and it necessarily has to be a semi-group. So now that we are looking at monoids, we know that they have to be semi-groups. So, so let's look at these, right? Let's, let's dive into monoid. So I'm just clicking down here on monoid and we can see, okay, well, as we said, a value that implements the monoid specification must also implement the semi-group specification. So we're going to have to look at the semi-group specification. And these rules we just understood, right? We said that if you, if you concat with the empty value, then you get back the original value. And if you take the empty value and, and you concat with some value, then you also get back that value. Like those are the same thing. Um, and then there's this, there's, we need to specify this thing called the empty method. But I guess let's, let's start with, uh, or actually, let, let's actually, because we're talking about empty from Ramda, let's actually start here. So if something is a monoid, then it needs to specify uh, a method called empty. So let's understand this, this syntax, right? It's like the, the method is called empty. So when you are passed, uh, or sorry, no, given that M is a monoid, if you then call the method empty on this on this type uh, m, then you will get back something. Or sorry, I, I said, yeah, yeah, sorry, of this type m. Yes, of of this type m. And then you will get back something of type m. So what I'm trying to and, and notice here also that it's um, it's a constant. It's a, it's a nullary function, right? It's a function that takes zero arguments. Uh, so when you call the 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 method empty on a, a mon monoid, so of any given monoid, let's let's say that this monoid is, is uh, called M, uh, then you will get back something of type M and this needs to be the empty value. And how do we know that that's the empty value? Well, if we look at these rules, then that specifies what it means to be the empty value, right? It's like, if you if you have something which is non-empty or empty and you concat, like for any, for any given M, if you concat that with the empty value, you should get back that same M. Right, it's like the 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 m has no effect, or the, sorry, the empty value has no effect, and this is why I said the addition, for example, over integers, positive integers. So zero would be the or maybe negative integers as well. I don't know. I mean, I think there is some. I think it might actually not be true, but let's. Oof, okay, let's let's just look at this positive integers monoid. 
Uh, free commutative monoid. No, but okay, that's cool. Okay, so so it seems to be true, right? Uh, whoops, that was kind of too big. Uh, so let's search for integers. The positive integers form a commutative monoid under multiplication. Ah, multiplication, not identity element one. Why not? Uh, why not addition? Oops. Or any. Yeah, no, I think also with addition, right? I guess with multiplication, but I guess also uh, addition. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I, but I guess that makes sense, right? It's like so. So let's let's be more specific, right? So what would the empty element be? What would the empty constant be if the structure is uh, positive integers and if the method is addition? Then the empty element would be zero, right? Because if you have ten and you concat quotation marks concat, so we're using the word concat in a very general sense now. We just mean take this one instance of the structure and concatenate it with this other instance of the structure. And when we say concatenate now, we mean the operation, which is add. So if you take 10 and you add 5, you have 15, right? But if you take 10 and you add the empty element, 0, then you get 10. Same thing, right? So, so that's uh, right identity. And left identity is if you take 0 and then you add 10, then you still get 10, right? And that's left identity. It's like, it doesn't matter which way you do it in. And that's why uh, the, the monoid can be formed both under addition, but also under multiplication. But the identity element, or sorry, the empty element is um, is one in if you're using multiplication. Think about, so, so I need to let the cat in, but think about division and subtraction meanwhile. Hang on. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, so, so subtraction and uh, and division does not form a monoid, right? Because it matters whether you do sort of ten over five or five over ten. And and actually, I mean, when you talk about division, it's like ten over zero is not even defined, right? Or sorry, I mean that makes no sense. Uh, zero is not necessarily the uh, the empty element. Or the empty constant, uh, but uh, or I guess the identity element. Actually, we should call it. Let's does if I just jump over to Haskell here for the Haskell documentation. Yeah, it's the identity element. Sorry. So empty is uh, so you so so I, I guess like strictly we should say that the empty method returns the identity element for that structure under that concat operation, right? So so that's why empty in the monoid positive integers returns the value, uh, uh, did I say addition, right? So em empty under the structure positive integers given the, um, uh, it's, it's given the operation addition uh, returns the identity element, which then is zero, because adding zero has no effect. But anyways, my, my point was that what, like un, under division, you might say that, well, the identity element needs to be one, because if you divide something by one, you get back the same thing, right? But that's not true, because then that only defines, uh, I guess, right identity, right? If you take 10 and you divide that by, by one, then you have 10. But if you take one and you divide that by 10, you don't have 10. So left identity doesn't hold. So hence it can't be a monoid. But anyways, okay, now we've talked about we've talked about empty. Let's try to move on. Sorry, the cat is messing around again. Okay. Um 
Uh, and so, yeah, we, we, so instead of saying a static method, I think I should start to say type representative here, as, as they are saying, right? It's like a value which has a monoid must provide an empty function on its type representative. So the, notice how they are using capital M here and then they're saying empty. So that would like in an object oriented world, it's like empty is a, is a static method that exists on the class uh, that implements the monoid specification. Um, and okay, so given a value m, one can access its type representative via the constructor property. And this is sort of what we talked about here with uh, where, when we were in the Ramda source code, where uh, you can uh, you can call dot constructor to get back the type representative or like to get back sort of the class. So if you have any given m here, sorry, the, whoop, can't you cannot play with the mic? Whoop. Tricky. <laughs> so if you have some given M, uh, then you can ask, you can say dot constructor, uh, and then you will get back the type representative, which means that you can make this full call. You can say M dot constructor dot empty in order to call the empty method on the, on the, uh, on the type representative, even though you have an instance, even though you just have an instance. Sorry. I, Okay, <laughs> we'll see if this works now. Okay, um, empty must return a value of the same. Mon yeah, okay, and then they're just saying empty must return a value of the same monoid. So, so it's not a valid implementation to say that if you have the string monoid and you call empty, then you get back an empty list. Even though empty list is also part of a monoid, it's from a different monoid. So it needs to be empty string because that's part of the same monoid. Okay, so that's monoid. But in order to, to, to be a monoid, you also must be a semi-group. So let's look at semi-group here. And semi-group is this, uh, I mean, it just requires the existence of concatenation, which, which is this sort of general concat thing, which if you ever look into Haskell is called mapend in Haskell, or also this strange symbol, I guess. Yeah, this strange symbol, like less than or uh, greater than, I think it's the same thing as mapend. Let's just check, is that an associative operation? Yeah, I think, yeah, mapend. Yeah, exactly, That's it's just an alias for mapend. So uh, this, uh, and I, I think mapend is probably because they're it's a toy with words on map. Um, yeah, anyways, let's drop that. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, and, and, and here you can see the rule is that you need associativity. So if you have three things from the same semi group, and it's and if you say a uh, concat b concat C, right, you take A, and then you concat in B, and then you concat in C, that should be the same thing as, as saying A concatted with the concatenation of B and C, right, notice the, the, the difference in the parentheses here. Uh, that's the same thing. And, and this is essentially just saying that I mean, if you think again about the now, now, now we're talking about a semi group, which is less strict than a monoid, but since any monoid is a semi group, let's talk about the integers over addition again. So we're just saying that like 10 plus 5 plus 2 should be the same thing as 10 plus uh, 5 plus 2, right? And that's true, of course. Uh, and actually, I think strictly what they what we the way we should define it is like this, right? 10 plus 5 plus 2 is the same thing as 10 plus 5 plus 2, or sorry, it's 10 10 plus 5 plus two is the same thing as 10 plus five plus two. So, right, and, and, and that's the rule. And concatenation can be anything, right? Concatenation can be anything that follows that rule, right? Uh, so, so let's read, and that's, a, that's not a method, or that's not a function on the type representative, that's an, a sort of instance method, let's say. It's, it's, a, it's a method on, any member of that type. So concat is a method that exists on some on, on any given thing that is a semi group, let's call that a. And if you have that a, and then you pass another a, uh, another another thing of the same type, so meaning another, th another instance of that semi group, uh, then you will get back a new a, right, which makes sense, because it's like, if you have 10, which is a member of the semi-group, or actually of the monoid, but let's think of them as a semi-group now. 
of the semi-group uh, integers over addition, and then you pass uh, five, uh, which is another member of the in another member of the uh, the, the semi-group integers over addition. Uh, then, uh, then you will get back a new integer, which which is like five concatenated into ten, which is then the same thing as ten concatenated into uh, five. Okay, actually, that happens to be the same case, but that's 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 not the point of associativity. Notice that the order matters, right? It's it's just that it matters whether uh, it's, so the order shouldn't matter when you ha when you're dealing with the empty element. That's that's the monoid stuff, right? In a monoid, it, the, the order can still matter, right? It can matter whether you do a concat b or b concat a. That those are potentially two different things. But but in a monoid, what must hold is that uh, a like a concatenated with the empty element or the identity element and the identity element concatenated with A. Those two things need to be the same thing. So that's when order doesn't matter. So, so I just sort of, I, I made it a bit confusing because I alluded to, I can't, I keep always forgetting what these things are called. It's not transitivity, it's, uh, I guess, com maybe commutativity. Anyways. Ooh. Sorry, my cat is trying to sleep on the computer, but it will totally overheat my computer, so I, I like, <laughs> I have to stop her. It's a bit tricky. Uh, anyways, um, so, but but uh, what we're actually the rule that we're actually looking at here is associativity, right? So it's actually just it's it's about the the way the order in which you structure the parentheses, right? And and here you can also see that list is also a semigroup, right? It doesn't matter. Let let's try that, right? I mean, if you have uh, one, if you have the list one, and then you concat that uh, with the list two, then you get one two. And so that's a concat b and then concat the list three, right? That gives you one, two, three. But if you use parentheses and say, well, let me actually uh, take the list two here. Yeah, sorry, concat like this. Concat and then, con so you take the list one and then you concat that with the concatenation of the list two concatted with three, then you get the same thing, right? Of course, the order in which you do these things, if you switch up the order, then that matters. But we haven't switched up the order, we've just switched up the parentheses. So so that's also a uh, a, a monoid, but because it's a monoid, it's also a semi-group. Um, Okay, and uh, and that's the uh, that's what it means to be a semigroup. So a value which has let's let's just keep reading here, right? A value which has a semigroup must provide a concat method. The concat method takes one argument, right? S concat b, uh, and in this case, then b must be a value of the same semigroup. And if if b is not the same semigroup, uh, behavior of concat is unspecified. If B, yeah, okay, so the fantasy land makes no claim as to what must happen if a user of this code takes something of semi-group, uh, like let's say S, and passes something of another type, right? If you say you have something of type S, and then you you you, you pass, you say concat, and then you pass something of a completely different semi-group, right? It, uh, this is a better example, right? If I have the list, if I have a list of one, two, three, and then I say concat, and then I say Concaten concatenate that with foo, right? JavaScript chooses to sort of just because it's a it, because it's a dynamic language, it just says, okay, fine, let's let's put the string foo in here. But actually, foo is also a a uh, or a, foo is a semigroup. Strings are a semigroup, right? So so you could define uh, concat as uh, as uh, or I mean, strings are even a monoid. Y you can define concat as a, as a concatenation of strings, right? Rather than sort of constructing an array, right? I mean, I guess concat doesn't exist on strings. Oh, okay, it does exist on, on strings in, in JavaScript, right? So if you concat foo with bar, then you get foo bar, right? Which makes more sense. That's a more sensible implementation of concat. And here you can probably see how sort of defining these or, or identifying these algebraic structures makes sense because then you know that actually, wait, there is something very fundamentally the same about list, lists and strings. So we don't have to be sort of ashamed when we construct a function that can operate on both lists and strings. It's just that we have to be very careful and realize what the things are that are common. And, and if we do that, then we don't have to resort to a lot of type checking where we say, okay, if it's a string, do this thing, if it's an array, do this thing. But, but it's like, because they both implement concat, you don't have to care about that. They just implement concat and you call concat and it works, right? It's like the data structure will do whatever the data structure deems necessary in that particular case. Okay, 
I digress. <laughs> um, so, and yeah, so, so we read that rule. And then concat must return a value of the same semi-group, right? Same thing as, as we talked about with the monoids. You can't, uh, so if you say foo, the string foo, and you concat the string bar, you can't get back a list, right? Like that fundamentally makes no sense. Okay, actually, I mean, if you specify that to make sense, it will make sense. But like <laughs> within, within uh, semi-groups, it doesn't make sense. Okay, now we know what semi-groups and monoids are. Let's 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 wrap this up, right? I'm going to close this down. But before we close this down, what I want to do is I want to jump into uh, Vim and open up a file called main.js. And let's actually just define our own uh, monoid. And let's try to call the let's try to pass our monoid to the the uh, empty function of Ramda. So let's first just uh, require Ramda here. Uh, and then save that let me map a keystroke to running this file in node and then let's run that uh, sorry maybe i should have said console log r dot uh, empty is what we're going to talk about right so let's run that and you can see that we get back a function which takes one argument okay cool let us now define our own monoid so i'm going to use a class and we're going to define as we talked about we're going to define the the structure or the type set over the operation union, so where concat is is union. So let's say we have a constructor that maybe takes. So let's think about that. Do we represent this? I guess we represent this as a list, right? So I mean, probably there are multiple ways of implementing this. Actually, sorry, let me just check that set is not actually a reserved. Ooh, sorry, set actually already exists in JavaScript. Ugh, such a failure. Uh, set JavaScript, then it's pretty silly that I'm implementing that because then we could just as well implement list. <laughs> uh, allows you to store unique values of any type. Oh, okay. So set actually already <laughs> set already does uh, what we wanted to do. So if I would say new set one, two, three, let's just see, does that so I'll put that in the variable s does that have a function concat? No, it doesn't, right? Uh, yeah, so I can't, I can't concat. So, so maybe we should. No, let's. I mean, what I was going to say is that maybe we should, like, monkey patch, or extend the class set, with, um, with the fantasy land functions rather than implement our own set class. But I mean, we could do that, right? Let's do that. Let's try to do that first. So what would that look like? So that, that, that would mean that we would have to define, as we said now, right? Set needs to have a concat method. Uh, no, sorry, the prototype. The prototype of set needs to have a concat method. And the, the set uh, type, what do they call it? The type, uh, a type representative needs to have the empty uh, have an implementation of empty. So so let's actually just build this, right? So so it's trivial, right? Because empty is a function that takes no argument, so it's a unary function, and that should just return a new set, right? I'm not sure if you specify, let's say, do, can I just say new set like that? Yeah, or do I have to pass an empty list? No, it's the same thing, right? So so I can just pass, I can just say new set, right? That's the implementation of empty. And what's the implementation of concat if we are building union? Then concat, uh, so I actually need to say is equal to a function, right? Because we need access to this, to the this keyword. And then we're going to be passed some other set. So let me call that set. So, oh, okay, actually, but I don't, <laughs> I don't know where the value is stored here. So let me just console log this to try to, to try to make sense of this. So, so let me, let me just say then that we have, as an example, we have S1, which is a new set, uh, let's say of one, two, three, and then we have S2, which is a new set of, let's say two, three, four, oops, two, three, four, so that there's some overlap, but not total overlap. And then we're going to try to say s1.concat s2. Let's save that and let's run that and see what we get. So we get back, of course, the set of one, two, three, when I console log this. But uh, what I wanted to know is how to get access to the underlying array. So maybe this whole monkey patching business is not a great thing to do. But actually, maybe they define union here with sets. Let's try and see, right? For each has keys, values. Ah, oh, okay, but you can say this dot values. Ah, okay. 
yeah and okay they are implementing union here so yeah so um, I guess we should be able to say yeah but then we don't have to call concat let's just say uh, s1 like console log s1 dot uh, values was it like that let's run that and uh, then we get an iterator so but that's not an array so can i say for example can i concat that with the list uh let's say just the list of 99 i'm just exploring now to see what that works uh, wait syntax error concat extra parenthesis okay no concat is not a function because it's an iterator so then we need to sort of turn that into an array right or like cast that into an array uh this off the top of my head i don't actually know how to do that uh, 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 uh returns that contains an array of value value so uh, entries wait i actually said values not entries it's kept similar to the map object so that each get yeah yikes okay but what you can do i guess is you can say for uh let uh, v in uh, s1 dot uh, so entries uh, console log v uh, 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 root console log s1 entries I'm so confused right now didn't return a new iterator object that contains an array of value value for each element so i mean because they implemented the union here and then they did for for var lm of so maybe i should i mean it doesn't matter that i use var right in oh okay sorry i i shouldn't say entries i should just say for each in the set return that value uh which still didn't work i get concat who yeah that's not cool maybe that's because i actually changed the the structure of this maybe why am i monkey patching we should just do this properly right if you have some set a you have some set b and then you construct a new set of set a then you say for var lm of oh sorry i said in this is my bad okay in refers to sorry then you get the 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 keys of that object of operates on the set or i guess on the list okay so it probably worked uh from the beginning as well so then i could probably say uh let's just so that we understand i could have probably set entries here as well ah but then we get pairs i wonder what that thing was all about so let's go back to entries here why why would you have value value for each element in the set this is kept similar to the map object so that each entry has the same value for its key and value here. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe there's some good reason for that. Who knows? Anyways, uh, let's say that, okay, so now, now we can iterate over it like this, right? So that means we could implement union uh, and that would essentially be, I mean, it's actually, let's cheat. This is essentially this, this implementation that they have here, right? Oh, okay, so there is an add method. So what we could do then is, is this, we could just say, uh, you have the set and then oh actually sorry I don't even need this is so silly I don't even need to implement this what I what I should do is I should just delegate I should return uh, this dot add this other set right like that's a sensible implementation then, then we're not even implementing it ourselves like add is essentially union right so if you I mean this is plain JavaScript if you forget about us defining a few silly methods up here uh, and we define these two sets, then I should be able to say s one dot add s two, and then let's just console log the result of that, and then you can see we have no, that is not the thing I was expecting. Set of set a. Why? That is very interesting. I mean, I wanted to get back s three, like a new set of uh one two three four right that's what i wanted to get back console log s3 aha sorry okay because add is not okay, okay 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 sorry it's not actually union it's adding a single element 
So if we added like 10, so that's why we can't just delegate blindly. No, 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 so it's adding a single element. Okay, so, so, so I'm wrong, so I'm wrong. So um, what we want to do, let's let's express this as a, as a test case, right? If we say, no, actually, yeah, let's keep S3, and then we want to we want to be able to do S1 concat S2, and then we want to we want S1 concat S2 to be equal to S3. We want that to be the same thing. Actually, I mean, maybe that's not going to be the case because it depends on how equality is defined. Uh, so let's say if I have S4 here, and that's a new set of uh, one, two, three, which is the same thing as set one, is then S1 equal to S4 or not, if we just run that, that's false. Okay, so we can't even do that test. So let's just visually test that, right? Like, is every element the same in, in um, yeah, so let's maybe do that, console log S3, that's our test. So let's just add a dummy implementation so that we can run it. So let's say, uh, yeah, let's just return the original set. Let's say that that's our implementation. So now our implementation is uh, returning the the original set, set one. Is that actually set one? Set one dot concat set to, oh, sorry, I, I should have said return this. Uh, yeah, so then you have set, uh, our implementation of concat returns one, two, three, but the expected output is one, two, three, four. So how do we do that? Well, what do we need to do? We need to say four, um, uh, so let, uh, uh, yeah, value of uh, the set, no, actually, of, let's say of this, uh, and then we put that value into uh, this one, right? So this dot add v, right? And then return this, yeah, something like that. Uh, this didn't work. This dot add v, v. Oh, sorry, I'm adding from the same one. I should say for every value in the set that we've been passed, add that value to this particular set that I'm already in, and then return that, right? And then we're getting back one, two, three, four, which is the expected the expected value. Sorry, there's a long journey to get something which is extremely simple. And of course, if I add more stuff into into S2, you can see that we get yes. Yeah, so sorry, now we have the wrong expectation. So let's remove that expectation. Then you can see that we can still add add more stuff. But the interesting point here is, of course, that we're, we are, we don't have duplication. So so notice how we didn't implement our own data type. Now we could have just as well done that, right? We could have just said like I have a class called Z. Let's say for example, so that it doesn't collide with set. And then it's like we have a constructor, da 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 da, da and we implement sort of the logic of of a set. Uh, but now we just said, okay, actually, well, there is a set class, but that set class is not a monoid because it doesn't implement the concat uh, interface. So we can turn that set class into a um, into a, a monoid by by sort of monkey patching in the the concat method. So we're turning it into a monoid over the operation union. Now, of course, you may not want to do this in actual in an actual real scenario, like actually just change the set class. Well, you might. I mean, what you could do. Uh, I was going to say that you could just construct an alias, but maybe that's problematic as well. Maybe it's like you would copy over the whole, okay, sorry, that's, I mean, in any real world scenario, we'd probably just re-implement the set class because it's probably extremely trivial. <laughs> that, that's probably what I would do anyways. Okay, so, uh, so now we have a monoid. So what, right? Um, well, we have this unifying interface concat and let's instead of saying s1 and s2, let's say m1 and m2, oops, uh, just to sort of emphasize that we had that I'm talking about monoids. So no, let's say that this is a sort of implementation, this last line is sort of the implementation of this general function that accepts monoids that we've built, then that can work on sets, but it could also work on let's say, um, I was going to say, yeah, but let's do strings, right? For, ex for example. So then let's say m1 is equal to, oh, sorry, not new, um, foo, or let's say hello, uh, and then let m2 is equal to world. So, so if I comment the first case out, uh, then, and we run with these two strings, then that works fine, right? So we have the same implementation, uh, but so actually maybe this is a bit stupid. So so let's let me instead define a function that I call uh, concat monoids. 
Actually, let's just call it concat. Why am I being silly? So uh, a function called mono, a function called concat that accepts m1 and m2, which are both two, uh, both monoids. And what it does is that it returns m1 dot concat m2. So uh, as long as both of these two things implement uh, the monoid interface, we will be able to pass those two things to this function. So now I can say console log concat uh, hello and world, right? And I can also say concat uh, a new set of one, two, three with a new set of uh, two, three, whoops, a new set of two, three, four, for example, like that. And let's remove that comment. Okay, I know, of course, these things need to happen after I've defined the function. Let's run that. And you can see in the first case, we get hello world. And in the second case, we get the set of one, two, three, four. I mean, this might seem extremely silly, but the point is that the concat method does not type check at all, right? If we were in a statically typed language, this would work because we would specify that concat takes a, an M1, which is a monoid, yeah, which is uh, which is a monoid essentially, right? And it takes some M2, which is a, a monoid, right? And regardless of what this syntax would look like, right? Um, but, or I mean, it's, it's like if, if we're in something Haskell-like, it'd be like concat is a method that uh, accepts this, that, that, right, like accept some A and then some A and then return some A given that, whoops, given that uh, A is a monoid, something like that. But, but that means we don't have to do any of this time checking stuff. Right? So, so, so you can construct functions that, that operate on lists or strings or sets or any arbitrary, strange, super complex type that you've invented that also implements the monoid interface. Okay, I think I'm totally killing this point. Am <laughs> I going overkill? Let's just finally look at Ramda's empty method, right? Let, let's take our newly constructed, uh, or, or rather newly converted um, set class because we've converted the JavaScript set class so that it, it uh, follows the monoid interface. Uh, so now if we would if we would say r.empty uh, and pass, let me just comment out these console logs. And, and pass in an instance of the set class. So let's say a new set of uh, one, two, three. What do we expect to get back if we can still log that, right? We expect to get back the empty set. So if I run this, you can see we get back the empty set. And if we, instead of passing the instance, if we pass just the, the class, quotation marks, the type, sheesh, what did they call it? The type, uh, type representative set, we should also expect to get back the empty uh, the empty set, right? Which we do, we get back the identity element. And this, th these two cases we get because of this branch in the implementation and this branch in the implementation. Uh, not because of these two, because we didn't specify these function, not functions, notice how, or methods. We I didn't say uh, that the method here, I mean, we called it empty, we didn't call it uh, ram no so uh, fantasy land dash land slash empty right this would be a, a fantasy land compatible version of what we just did and actually let's just try that fantasy land slash concat like that and then if we run this this still works right we get empty sets and of course like again like let's make sure that we fail for the correct reason so if i rename this function to blah, blah, blah and this method also sorry i should have said method to blah, 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 blah and then we run this, then, I mean, it's not working, right? We're getting back arguments, right? So maybe, also maybe that's why arguments, hmm, no, let's not think about that. I was thinking maybe that's a default in some sense. But, but yeah, you can see we don't get back an empty set, so we've failed to implement, uh, or we've failed to turn the set class into a monoid over a union. And of course, let me just emphasize that, I mean, you could, of course, just monkey patch this into... It doesn't have to be over union. I just Googled a bit quickly before and, and somebody said that, or I mean, I think it was probably Wikipedia, <laughs> that uh, uh, the sets are also monoids over intersection, which makes sense, right? It's like, I mean, if you look at intersection, it's like, or, I mean, we don't have to look at it. It's like the, what's common between the two sets. So, so that should also form a monoid. So we could have defined that, right? It's like, we, we just say for every, for every value in the set that I've been passed and for every value in the set that I have, let's find the things that are common and let's return a new set of that, 
right? And then the empty, uh, the 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 empty method or the identity element for that monoid would also be the empty set. But so so you could have defined that as well. But you can't really define both at the same time because they need to occupy the space of the concat method. So then you need to find a different way of of uh, doing that. And like. Yeah, at these points, this is probably when you start to look into things such as Haskell, because in Haskell you could, you could say that it be, or I mean, I shouldn't say Haskell, I should say maybe a statically typed language, because then you can explicitly say, I, I want this thing to behave as a, I mean, it's like, I know this thing is a monoid, and I know this thing is a, um, no, actually, that was an extremely bad example, I was, <laughs> yeah. Because I was going to say that I, I know this thing is a monoid and I know this thing is a, let's say, semi-group. But this, in this scenario, I want it to behave as a monoid. Um, but, uh, but yeah, let's forget about that. I mean, I don't actually, hmm, let me think about this and then I'll return. If somebody has a good idea of how to, uh, how to implement both the union and uh, intersection at the same time, while both are uh, sort of forming monoids, over set, of course that I understand, I understand of course that, that that's not possible, but what's an elegant way of sort of maintaining both things at the same time, right? It's like, do you construct two different classes that sort of share some code or is there, is there another way? If you have some thoughts, please do shoot that. And I hope this makes a lot of more sense than the last video. If it doesn't, do let me know in the comments. Um, thanks a ton for watching. I mean, as usual, if you've made it this far in the video, yeehaw, I, I hope you're feeling that we're learning functional programming. So thanks a ton for watching. Remember to subscribe, hit the like button if you appreciate the video. Let me know if you have any comments in the comments or questions in the comments. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.